Hello, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. Over the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about gardening, answer your questions, see a couple videos, and just discuss everything outside. And to do all that, we've got a great panel of expert, experts. I'm Shane Cultura. I'm from Country Arbors Nursery. I'm one of the co-owners of Country Arbors and Onarga Nursery, and I'm happy to be a fifth generation. We're going to be celebrating our 150th wow. anniversary wow. this year, so uh, it's, <coughs> that's kind of exciting. But I've also got some great panelists, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and I'm going to start with Kent. Hi. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kent Miles. I'm the owner of Illinois Willows. We are a specially cut flower grower out in the Seymour, Illinois area. And uh, we had an uh, email question about hibiscus bushes. I have a hibiscus bush that is seven to eight years old. It has never been trimmed or pruned. I used it, I used to have it really pretty small pink flowers on it. Now it flowers, but not near what it used to. And it's getting woody. Uh, does it need to be pruned, cut, sheared? with clippers, and is that too much? Uh, when should uh, this be done? And um, Paul sent this question in, and in the photographs that we have, uh, it shows two different types of hibiscus. Uh, one is a more of a landscape perennial type hibiscus, which comes up and leaves out every year and blooms. The other is more of a greenhouse or tropical hibiscus. Um, the uh, one on the left, which has the red flowers, uh, generally uh, is the perennial type, and it'll drop its leaves in the fall and then come back in the spring with uh, new flowers. You can trim out the canes uh, to help rejuvenate it. Uh, we do that prior to uh, the leaves budding out in the spring. Uh, if you happen to have the one on the right, which has a smaller oval-shaped leaf, it is more of a tropical hibiscus, and they generally uh, can be cut back. Uh, I would probably do maybe about a third of the plant at a time. And uh, if it's the indoor or tropical type, that's generally what you have out on your decks and patios during the summer times. They're either grown as a bush or a standard variety. Uh, they have the similar flowers as the outdoor type. Um, if you do go ahead and cut it back, I would probably do it prior uh, to setting it out and also uh, applying a, a fertilizer solution at that time when you do set it out. And um, they do really great uh, during the s summer months and fall, and then you'd have to bring it back in. Yeah, and, I, and I, as a grower of the hibiscus, fertilization is overprescribed. If mm -hmm. there's any kind of problem, they say fertilize it, but on hibiscus, we find that that's probably, that and burning bush need more food than anything right. in the whole nursery. So they can turn yellow and get chlorotic and not flower as well from lack of mm -hmm. hibis or lack of fertilizer. So that's something, it's a heavy, heavy feeder. Yeah. All right, well, we've got another panelist with us that knows plenty of things, and you're gonna tell <laughs> us all about yourself and your area of expertise, Kay? Okay, hi, I'm Kay Carnes. I'm the Champaign County Master Gardener, and my area of expertise is herbs, uh, vegetables, especially heirloom vegetables, and, and some perennials. <clears throat> and I have a show and tell tonight. I brought, um, this is a brick of core, and that's spelled C-O-I-R. And I use that in my potting soil. I mix it with potting soil, and it helps prevent potting soil from drying out. And it also um, ha adds, you know, nice, um, it's nice and fluffy. So I use it in my potting, I mix it with potting soil and use it for starting seedlings and um, just, um, you know, growing plants in pots. And it, it's really great stuff. And you buy it in these bricks um, <clears throat> and then you put the brick in a bucket and add about three gallons of water and wait a couple hours. And then you end up with this nice fluffy, um, material that just is really great for drainage and um, and helps um, it, you can actually use this alone as as a potting soil rather than uh, mixing it but I like to mix it with potting soil um, I make my own mix I add the core and also uh, mushroom compost to my potting soil 
and that gives it a little um, fertilizer as well as as a excellent drainage. Yeah, so you can it's get a great them, product. Yeah, it is. You get them online. Um, I just go online and Google it. And I don't know if some of the local nurseries carry it. Yeah, the local garden centers have it too. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because it's so small and compressed, a lot of people actually think it's a brick, and they're not. A lot of people don't know how to use that. I know. And, and a little bit goes a long way. It does. Once you add water to that and wet it mean, up, it's this brick will form eight gallons of yeah, of see. core of yeah, usable and that's just from soil. that tiny little brick. So it's yeah. If you if you don't know what you're looking for, you probably won't use it. But mm -hmm. now that they've seen it, it's it's yeah. a really good product. It really is. I yeah. I just I've used it for years and absolutely love it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. And last but not l not least, uh, my friend John, who I keep seeing a couple times a week now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've been we've been in the right places. The right circles. Yeah. Um, my name is John Bodensteiner. I'm a master gardener from Vermilion County, and my I really like perennials, hostas, uh, vegetables. I, I, I like tomatoes. I grow a lot of tomatoes, peppers, and just about anything green that I, I have a lot of everything in my yard. One of the things I do have in my yard is a poplar tree. And what I um, have is um, we had a question. Somebody had a, a poplar tree. Their grandparents had planted one when they were born and they were moving and wanted to have have a um, cutting of it. Well, I, I went out my yard this this morning and dug this up. It was a little frozen. I did dig it out. So it, I usually would, if I was going to, to do this, I would cut it a little bit longer. So that would be about this long on each side. But you can see there is roots coming off of it. So this is a very good um, plant to, you just dig, take this. I usually put them in pots just for a little bit so I can control the environment and uh, after that then take it and put it wherever you're going to. So um, this is from North Dakota originally. It was on our farm and I brought it down and I've I've let a couple of them grow. Used to be considered the largest plant in the world. Uh, there's a couple mushrooms now up in Russia that have exceeded this because when when I planted the original, these shoot out and then put up new runners that you can see where the root put up this new plant. And so I, I have all the poplars that I really want, and uh, they're really pretty. They're white, and and uh, yeah. they they the, when it's windy, it's a quaking aspen, another name, and they tend to make a nice sound in the in the summer. Yeah, people see them in Colorado and other. Mm -hmm. They don't think of them in Illinois, but yeah. they do grow pretty well yeah. here. They don't have any hardy problems. All right, well, we answer lots of questions when you call in, but before we do that, we're going to go ahead to and go to a Did You Know segment. Cabbage, kale, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, Chinese cabbage, and savoy are all the same species of plant. However, they are so selectively bred that they no longer resemble one another. Ironically, my wife served all those for dinner last <laughs> night. Every, I, almost every single one of them. The Brussels sprouts are good. Cut them in half, fry mm -hmm. them up, and they're pretty good. Oh, yeah. But she had to convince me of that. All right, well, we're going to go to the phone lines, and we're going to start off with line one, Julia. Hi, Shane. Hi, how are you doing? I'm fine. I've been out in the yard working today, and I have a lot of bare spots in my yard. A lot of them, I think, are winter-driven, but also underneath some trees and uh, areas, and I'm wondering when the best time to reseed. Right. I think right now is a good time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're supposed to have some rain maybe tomorrow. So uh, I would, you know, it, depending on your soil conditions, um, kind of rake it up a little bit. It's really slimy out there right now. There, the the uh, deep soil is still froze, so the frost is coming up. So you can really compact your soil. So you have to be really careful when you're out there. But just run a, a, a little bit of rake over it. Put the um, seed down and it, just the heaving, and that will work the, the seeds into the ground. and I'd say now is as good a time as any. Yeah, with the ground, it's so wet out right now yeah. and the ground's heaving and you know doing all that change, it's gonna naturally draw all the it's, seeds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is about, and that last snow, although we don't know when that last snow, yeah. if yeah. you gotten it over the top of that and let that melt in, it would have been a perfect mm -hmm. time to do it. But we, we <coughs> hopefully, 
you hopefully know, we depending don't have where you live, but uh, <laughs> ours was our last snow. But it's a really good time if you can get out there and get the grass seed down. And remember, if it's a, I said this the other night, if it's an open spot, it's going to be filled with something. You might as well fill it with grass yeah. seed before it's filled with weeds. All right, well, thank you for that phone call. We're going to go to another line. We're going to go to line two, Bob. Bob, you had some questions for us? Yes, I do. I have um, some tropical plants that I have wintered over in a sunny room. There's some tropical hibiscus and Amanda Villa, and the hibiscus get white flies, and I've not come up with anything to control them. Um, I'll get rid of them for a day maybe, and then they're back. And then I have aphids really badly on my Amanda Villa. Yeah, the <laughs> hibiscus are magnets for white flies. Yeah, I, yeah. We, had a, we had a greenhouse, and, and that was the one plant that had more white flies than anything, and then they spread. And <clears throat> to get rid of them, it's, it's not a one-time thing. You're going to have, have to do it over and over and over until you do get rid of them, until we get them outside. Then, then some of the natural predators, predators will, take will take care, care of them that, outside. Yeah. You don't have uh, any of those inside, probably, so... Uh, insecticidal soap. soap would be my first uh, choice. If they're yeah. not, if it's not real big, what I would do is take it into the shower and give it a nice rinse. Um, and if you want, then take some insecticidal soap and spray the underside of the leaf, spray the top side, and then wait for a week. And you're probably going to have to do it again until mm -hmm. we can take it outside. Probably about two or three applications. Yeah, because you get the adults right away, and then the the, the, eggs. Right, the eggs and that. And you can, you know, it's not for everybody. I don't have cats or kids, or at least kids are going to eat it. So I use a kind of a pre-emergent granular mm. that I mix in there. And it's, it's a chemical, but it does mix into the soil and it lasts for 30, 60 days mm -hmm. and pretty much takes care of everything. And there's, they sell them in little like capsules you actually st uh, stick in the soil or it's a granular that you can work in there and water it in. And they both work and their insecticidal soap is obviously better, but, um, I'm a little lazier, so I have just <laughs> well, a tiny if bit you're of chemical. Busy, I mean, it, it takes it's it's yeah. a commitment to that plant. And a hibiscus, you, it's not if you're going to have a bug; it's what kind yeah. you're going to have yeah. and how bad is it, yeah. it? It is. So, those are a couple ideas to help you get rid of it. And it, the time's coming. Hopefully, we're going to get those out on the porch and get clear them up a little bit. And then Same you can with just, the aphids. Just shake them off with a garden hose here pretty soon. So, all right. Well, thank you for the phone call. We're going to go to another phone call. Uh, we've got Kathy. Hi. Um, I'm going to be moving an entire garden um, of perennials. It's in the wrong place. So um, I've got Stelladoros. I've got everything else. I need to find out when I should be digging them, what I should do to the soil, because the soil I'm putting it into has been dug out pretty well. Um, but I need to really, um, really get it ready. And I don't want to lose these, these things. Um, they've been in there for years. So, uh, what do you recommend? I don't know how she could get rid of Stella Dioro. <laughs> <laughs> just, I would pot them up and uh, until, because right now, it, right now you're going to have even trouble get, digging them up. Wait till the ground is thawed out and then pot them up. Stella Dioro, Dioro are so hardy. Um, those little tubers down underneath, they just uh, will, will survive. I, I, I've had them survive in a pot for a couple of years and uh, before I got them finally where I wanted them. Make sure that your garden is fully in sun and that you prepare the soil. But um, I usually like to pot them up and that way I can control the, the environment a little bit more, put them in some shade so that the sun, because once you dig them up, they're gonna be some shock there, but put them in, in the shade a little bit for a couple of days until they adjust. And mm -hmm. I think if you have like hostas and daylilies, and other things you can also divide them yeah mm -hmm. yeah and you can get more plants and then <coughs> go ahead and pot them up and then uh the new garden make sure that you've got it amended you know with um i do a soil test first see what you're lacking in nutrients and then you know usually some peat moss or things like that would help uh work it in and then you know these plants can be in the pots all summer until you get your new location ready to go and it sounds like, though, she maybe picked the wrong spot in her own yard, mm -hmm. and she's moving from one. So if that's the case, the more soil you can get on it, and it mm -hmm. doesn't even know it's being moved, if you can get a big thing of soil and all the roots 
and then you can place it. But you know, I think she said she wants to prepare the soil, mushroom compost, mm -hmm. tilling, preparing that beforehand, and then getting a big clump. I think potting it's the ideal way, but if she wants to go quickly from one side of the yard to the other and not go through that yeah. middle step, mm -hmm. then get as big a shovel as you can carry and move everything over there. And, I think and then remember, once you move it for the first couple of years, you want to make sure, you know, right now we don't need to water, but eventually watering is, is extremely important for the first yeah. for the first year and even into the second year. It's a new plan, essentially, yeah. once mm -hmm. you've dug it out. Yeah. It can be done. We do it mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. At least she admits she put it in the wrong spot. Yeah. A lot of us <laughs> let it go, <laughs> let it die before we admit we've made a mistake. So. All right, well, we're going to go to another round of questions, and we're going to go ahead and have Kent go answer one more round of emails. Okay. Um, this one's from Jim and Debbie, and we, it's uh, questions about tree peonies. And we're wondering if the longer stems on a tree peony that are leafless, except for the tops, can be trimmed back to produce a more robust plant. Uh, the plant's uh, about five foot tall, and when is a good time to trim it? Uh, generally, tree peonies, you do not trim at all um, because that kind of gives them their name as far as a tree peony. You have the bare stems, and then you have the foliage, and then the blossoms at the top of the uh, stems. Uh, if you do have to, and you do want to trim it, uh, you do want to trim it after it has done flowering, uh, which we're probably looking at the first of June. Um, you'd want to selectively just trim it to a more uh, aesthetically shaped, uh, make it a more of aesthetically shaped plant. For instance, if one side's growing really, really tall, I would go ahead and trim those. Um, when you do trim down into the wood um, and also underneath the, the faded blossom that has, you know, that this season's blossom, you're going to uh, sacrifice next year's blossom on that stem because after it's done blooming this year, it forms the buds for next year. Uh, but if you do want to go ahead and do it, just do make me two or three each year until you get the shape you want. Yeah, that, that tree peonies, that's what, it's pretty easy to tell, but you'd be surprised how many people hack back. A, yeah. And yeah. they're not a cheap, you no, know, a, no. they can cost $100 for a plant. So mm -hmm. yeah, you definitely be a little bit more careful with those. All right, Kay, you've got That's another right. good question. You got a question for us then this time? I do. I have a zucchini question. All right. <clears throat> this is from Jeannie in Toledo. And she said, I'm sure you have answered this question before, but please help me with my zucchini. I try to grow them every year, and every year they produce a good crop once on huge, beautiful plants. But before the next crop gets big enough, they will completely wilt and die. I have been told this is from a moth's egg, but how do I stop it? I've tried moving them from year to year, and I've tried skipping a year to plant it, but it hasn't helped. The same thing will happen to pumpkins if I try to grow them. Well, if it, if it is indeed uh, from a moth, you're probably dealing with squash vine borer. Um, the moth, and the reason you probably get your first crop is because in the life cycle, the moth um, emerges about oh, late June to early July. And then they lay their eggs on the squash and the eggs turn into larva and the larva move into the stems of the squash. And then um, they begin feeding on the inside of the stem of the squash. <clears throat> and so what you'll see is, is um, the vines will you know, wilt and die immediately or well, at some point after the um, larva have been in there. So the thing to do is, is to really scout the, your squash plants and look at the base of the plant um, where the stem comes out of the ground. Uh, if it's squash vine borer, you'll see, uh, they call it frass, but it looks like um, um, sawdust a little bit. Um, and then you can go in and you can um, actually find, you can see the worm in the, in the stem and just cut them out because the stem is hollow. Um, <clears throat> you can also treat them with an uh, insecticide, um, but you need to, to really scout those plants repeatedly um, to get them out of there. Yeah. Um, All right. If, if it kills one and not the others, just immediately yank the one that's dead and, and then just really keep scouting. 
the uh, uh, the rest of them. Yeah, usually the plant's big enough if you just get that first one mm -hmm. before it spreads mm -hmm. and lays its eggs. Yep, I know. I usually let my neighbors grow enough zucchini. One person grows enough for the whole neighborhood. So, <laughs> All right. Well, I see somebody doing some woodwork over here. So, uh, John, <laughs> you've got a bunch of stuff to yeah, show us. I, <clears throat> I've had some questions on mason bees or orchard bees. Uh, they're called Osmia ligonaria is the species name. <laughs> I bought this one. It's been quite a few years because I've had to replace parts of it. But when I bought it, this is a, a four by four. And as you can see, the holes here, that, that, that's where the mason bees uh, lay their eggs. And there can be six to eight, ten uh, baby eggs laid in each w one of these tubes. And the problem with this one is that it's four inches <coughs> and males are the ones that are probably going to, they, the, 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 that the babies come out are going to be mostly males. So what I've done is I've made another one and this shows um, where I dug uh, holes uh, six inches deep and this is my uh, drill that I used and I put a stopper on it so that it was exactly uh, six inches and with that now I'm going to get mostly female eggs being hatched and put a cover on it they do like a sturdy base uh, these do not produce honey but they are very, very good as far as uh, uh, going through and pollinating. Uh, you want to put them someplace where there may be a source of mud. Uh, that hole that I drilled should be 5 sixteenths of an inch deep. And it's at least 6 inches into the wood. Uh, you want to have the, the, the nest facing southeast. And these bees probably won't travel much farther than 100 yards from where you have the nest. And they'll come out about the time that the red buds start to bloom. So if your orchard is not blooming, what you can do is very carefully take your nest, put it in the refrigerator until your red buds start to bloom, and then within three days, or take it out then when they start to show, and three days you'll have your bees. Yeah, and pe people don't realize there's a lot more, there's a lot of different kinds of bees. And these are native where the yeah. honeybees are yeah. all from Italy. And the natives seem to be doing okay, not nearly as much problem with them. But because yeah. these don't form colonies, so they're, they're more they don't have the solitary decline. bees, so yeah. they don't have that colony decline. All right, well, just to remind everybody, we do take uh, questions via email, so you can send in those pictures and send in those emails, and we can answer them on the show, or perhaps we might even e uh, answer them off the show and get your answer a little quicker. And you can look on the screen there. It's at yourgarden at gmail.com. So we're going to get back to the phone lines, but before we're going to do that, we're going to do a quick video, a quick mag quiz. <laughs> Which vegetables will grow best in the shade? A. Root vegetables B. Leafy greens C. Vegetables that grow from flowers B. Leafy greens Leafy greens consist of lettuce, spinach, arugula, endive, radicchio, kale, cabbage, and mustard. Again, what I had for dinner last night. <laughs> All right, we're going to get back to the phone lines, try and get at least in that one more question in. We're going to go to line three with Richard. You've been patient. Richard, you have a question for us? Yes, sir. Uh, hopefully one of the four of you can answer it. Uh, I'm wanting to put up a privacy fence, but I don't want to put up a fence, and I don't want to put up a hedge. Is there anything I could plant that would grow, uh, say, maybe six to seven feet high that I could use for a privacy fence? You guys want to take that one? We, we do it all the time. It just depends if you want evergreen or yeah. uh, if you want deciduous. Evergreen, it's, it's a little tougher to get things at six feet because a lot of plants, evergreens, don't stop at six. Yeah. So you'll see some whole strip arborvitae that gets six or seven feet tall. Um, yews, Hicks I use are making a huge comeback because they're out of fashion. They were a little, you know, in the 50s and 60s, everybody had them and everybody tore them out. Mm -hmm. But we're finding with these droughts and these crazy weather that they tend to be the hardiest of all of them. Yeah, the arborvitae have really taken Yeah, they are, the exactly. So the, the yews, you know, what's old comes back mm -hmm. and vice versa. So the yews are making a comeback. And then shrubs, there's tons of, there's, you know, viburnums yeah. and... Euonymus. Euonymus, yeah. yeah, burning bush. And mm -hmm. there's all different kinds of, of good things that will make 
Great hedge. So you're really open there, but you know a little more specific of whether you want to see what's behind that or not. But plenty of choices depending on the topography. You'll just have to go to your local garden center and kind of ask them uh, or give them a little more information about what you're searching for. All right, we're going to try and sneak in one quick question. We're going to go to Tom with grass seed question. Tom, you'll have to make it quick. Okay, I'm going to make it real quick. I'm going to look at this too. Uh, I don't know if it's a wife's tale, a wife's tale or not about, about putting grass seed in early in the winter time. So you put your grass seed down when the last snow comes. Is it better to wait because then the grass seed it pounds into the ground, or wait for the you know closer to springtime? When is actually the best time to grow your brand new grass seed for springtime? Right. It varies depending on the year because if you're getting lots of heaving and frosting, it's going to take that seed right in. The snow is going to kind of do the same. Once it melts, it it takes it down, and it just depends a lot on the year and. Yeah, you can overseed it and not waste too much money on the overseeding, or you can just do it right now when the time looks yep. pretty good. But, yep, time to seed. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next week on Mid-American Gardener. Thanks.